Okay guys, we're gonna do a general walkthrough here of the three kilowatt, 24 volt, 120 volt output stackable inverter from GrowWatt. Very popular unit. You might have seen a lot of things all over the internet with people using it. Uh, so we're gonna do a walkthrough here uh, of just the environmental parameters that we think you should operate under uh, per the manufacturer specs. So try to follow these to make sure you don't get in trouble with warranty and have problems with your system. Uh, the inverter should be mounted on a non-flammable surface, so don't use a piece of plywood as the backing or OSB. You can use hardy backer, you can use uh, tile board, uh, you can use metal uh, or metal uh, channel, but don't mount it on wood. It's not something that's recommended for safety. Uh, the uh, minimum battery cable size is also very important. Uh, we're going to need at least a zero gauge battery cable. Now you can use something larger, but of course it's whatever will fit in these holes, but zero gauge easily fits. Don't go economize on your battery cable. You'll starve the inverter for power and you will damage it and void the warranty. Uh, the maximum solar wattage for the invert, uh, because it's 24 volts, it can only handle about 2,500 watts of solar output. So don't oversize your array beyond that by very much at all. Uh, it shouldn't be significantly more than 2,500 watts. If you've got to get within a few hundred watts because of the way your panels land, so be it. Now, the other thing to remember is the minimum solar panel voltage necessary is uh, 30 volts under load and 40 volts open circuit. So you have to achieve at least that. Most people are using larger strings, obviously. This the unit will go up to 150 volts. So just make sure that your minimum is at least over the 40 volts open circuit if you're using panels with this. You won't have enough driving force to charge your batteries. Uh, the operating environment temperature is important as well. Uh, the minimum temperature is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I'd love for people to operate with a little more of a safety factor there, but the problem you can run into below 32, any moisture that's gotten into the inverter becomes ice, Icing inside of relays, stuck relays, stuck control electronics, just bad for the whole situation. And that's not something that we support or recommend. So make sure you've got an environment that will stay above freezing. Uh, the maximum temperature is 131 degrees. Uh, most people can keep it out of a temperature that's that high, but if you pick the hottest shack out in the open in Nevada, you might get there. It's always better for the life of the inverter to try to keep it in a more cool place. Doesn't necessarily need to be air conditioned, but try to put it in a unit that's not going to get that hot. Uh, if you're worried, leave a thermostat and check when you first set this up because you will wear down the inverter faster at higher temperatures. Uh, on the AC input side of the inverter, some interesting parameters we gotta watch for here. The max AC charger load for the invert, if you want to charge from an AC source like the power grid or a generator, is 2,000 watts. Now, when you're sizing an AC input wire, you have to add the full power load of the inverter to the AC input wattage. Because the reality is that when the inverter is charging from AC, it's not longer an inverter. So your wire has to do two things, run the inverters loads that you signed up for, for your whatever you're designing the system for, and run the charger. So it's a sum of those two. 3,000 watts for this inverter, plus 2,000 watts for your charger. It's 5,000 watts you need to be able to carry. Uh, that's gonna be about a 43 amp AC input load. You're gonna need eight gauge copper minimum to achieve that and a 50 amp breaker. Uh, at 120 volts, obviously, per inverter. On the generator sizing aspect of AC input, uh, you can take that total load of 5,500 watts, and that's great, but with generators, you have to build in a factor of 50% of oversizing in order to make sure you don't collapse the generator's voltage sine wave. When you start loading that generator close to full, you have a major drop in power quality uh, there are several things that are at risk if you allow that to happen. The inverter's internal electronics are going to be starved for voltage. You're going to damage the inverter. It'll break pretty fast. Not just that, other electronics in your house, if you put it, hook them up to a strain generator, are going to be starved for power. Your refrigeration, TVs, electronics, if you don't like buying new electronics and appliances, don't 
overload a generator. Don't go put a 6,000 watt generator on a 5,000 watt potential load. It's going to be bad news for everything involved. Uh, so if you do the math on 5,000 watts continuous, you need about an 8,000 watt generator to achieve the level of overbuild minimum to have a decent quality generator experience. If you want to have two inverters parallel stacked together, you will have to have a generator that is now double the size, three inverters triple the size, and you're not allowed to just feed one inverter with the generator if they're in a stack. They will require common AC input parameters, so one can't have a generator and the other doesn't. So by the time you've got two inverters, now you need a 16 kilowatt generator. Uh, and and this, this is one of the most important factors for people getting into this. I mean, our, our typical advice is that, you know, given that most people don't have inverter generators that big, we don't encourage people to buy these massive generators for battery charging. Use the generator you have and don't use the inverter as a battery charger. Get a separate battery charger to charge your batteries from your generator. It'll maintain a pure quality power through the house because it'll always be coming through the inverter and your, in your generator will just be making DC power to dump into your batteries. That tends to be the best approach. You've got some really cost efficient battery chargers available. If you're looking for any kind of cost efficiency overall, that's the best strategy typically. But if you're gonna use a generator, you have to follow these minimum parameters. You have to use a big enough generator and the, the numbers are very rigid. Okay, y'all, one other important thing to remember with the inverter is the power switch procedure. You have to keep the power switch off when you're working with your batteries. You do not ever want to be in a situation where the power switch is left on and you apply new DC voltage because you've just repowered your batteries, turned the batteries back on, whatever you use to control your batteries. If you apply live DC voltage, to an inverter with an on switch that is turned on, you're going to surge a massive amount of DC amperage into the inverter and will very likely, in most cases, destroy a lot of control electronics inside of there. It's a very quick and easy way to destroy your inverter. It's something that we're gonna be able to see when we review it uh, for any kind of warranty claims. Just let's all work together and make sure that we keep that switch off when we're working with our batteries wait till we see the voltage we want on the bus bars, and then turn the switch on. Take this process a little slowly and make sure you're doing it right and nothing gets broken. And that's really it, guys. Just keep track of these factors, you know, the, the mounting and the battery cables, your, your general environment, your panel voltage parameters. Keep track of that. You're gonna have a great experience with Sandberg. Thanks for watching.